Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I, I will continue with this uh, series of examples of partially hyperbolic systems. But uh, as I announced this morning, now we will switch to give examples of uh, partially hyperbolic systems in this in a in a weaker setting that I recall again. So we said that f was partially hyperbolic if there existed a filtration. Okay, a filtration was something like this. And all of these open sets were attracting neighborhoods, meaning that F of UI closure is contained in UI, such that the maximal invariant sets in these neighborhoods A equals intersection N of F of N. is partially hyperbolic splitting. This meant that T lambda i splits as a stable plus a center plus an unstable direction. OK, so you may say, and these uh, filtrations were, uh, were something like this. You, you have this open set. First is uh, the whole manifold. Then you have an open set over here, an open set over here. Each one is mapping inside itself. And what you're looking is this lambda i correspond to the set of points that remain here in this region over here. And now what we are asking is that the, the dynamics might not be globally partially hyperbolic, but inside of each of these sets, we have a partially hyperbolic splitting. And essentially, this, uh, in principle, provides a larger class uh, of examples. So let me tell you that, in fact, it provides a much larger class of examples. And by this, let me just recall a, a very old theorem by Schuban Smale. It says that a hyperbolic Uh, diffeomorphisms are dense in the C0 topology among diffeomorphisms. So why, why is this result interesting for us? Because uh, this morning we had to work a lot in order to obtain examples of partially hyperbolic systems. And each one was kind of uh, difficult to get. So we had these algebraic or geometric examples, which were the starting points. And then we had to start with them to construct new ones. And we, we have no other way of constructing examples. And in principle, as in the example I mentioned this morning, and Silvan also said that this theorem by Franks and Newhouse says that being hyperbolic in the whole manifold gives a lot of constraints on the topology of the manifold. However, here, this theorem is telling you that whatever the manifold is and whatever the isotopy class of diffeomorphism you are looking in, you can approach it by a hyperbolic diffeomorphism. And so this local property, the fact that we are asking hyperbolicity only in the recurrent part, gives a lot of liberty to create examples. OK, so now we, we will look more to localized uh, kind of examples. OK? <coughs> so the, the first type of examples I will do is the ones I promised in the morning, which are skew products. Okay, so let me say what a skew product is. So 
So you have f from m to m, a diffeomorphism, and you have k inside m, a partially hyperbolic set. Splitting T K M Okay, so now we are not asking the whole manifold to be hyperbolic or partially hyperbolic. We just need a compact invariant set which is partially hyperbolic. So for example, you can choose the horseshoe that uh, Sylvan explained the other day, a hyperbolic attractor, or even a a periodic orbit or whatever. And so now we will choose she to be uh, a function from M to the space of diffeomorphisms of another manifold N. Okay? But we will require that the, the contraction and expansion that these diffeomorphisms have in the direction of n is smaller, is dominated essentially by the, con the expansion here and the contraction here. So how, how do we write that? We write it like this. Such that. Um, F that for every x in k, if we are outside k, we don't matter. It's, Okay, so we have that DES is smaller than the minimal uh, contraction of she here. Okay, so she is a diffeomorphism of N, so we don't have to restrict to uh, anywhere. This is always smaller or equal than uh, x than the norm here, and we re require this one to be smaller than the lowest expansion here. We wrote like this. So now, what are we going to look at? We're looking to look at this diffeomorphism, m times n. Itself, such that f of x, y equals f of x, she x of y. Okay. For example, an example we did in the morning, so you just take she to be constant equal to the identity, and so you will always have this condition. And the, the point is that you have the following <coughs> proposition that tells you that um, the set K times n is partially hyperbolic for f big f with splitting t k times n m times n and we can say a little bit more we can say exactly who this bundle is and we can say more or less who these bundles are so what we are we know such that so the bundle 
EC hat is exactly the bundle EC that we had here times the tangent bundle to N. And these bundles, we don't know exactly where they are. Okay? They, they, they need not be the same bundles that uh, we had for F, but at least we know that they will project into these bundles. So, and if pi from M to N to M is x, y maps to x, then the derivative of pi sends each of these bundles into the correct one. Okay. So. okay? So when when you multiply here by the identity, it's an exercise to show that the new bundles are exactly the stable, the stable or unstable bundle you had times zero. So there's no contribution into, this, into the new part of the tangent bundle. However, when you make something more complicated, which is mixing, then it's, it's possible that the diffeomorphism changes the angle of this. But by a, a simple cone criteria, you can show that this is partially hyperbolic. Okay, so this, the proof of this is, is really easy, and, and we are leaving it as, as an exercise. So, and before I, I continue to explain where, why, why I wanted to do skew products over general sets and the motivations for this, let me first give a, an example of a skew product which is not so nice in the sense that the, the the, the manifold is not a product, okay? So it's a, a very beautiful example due to Bonatti and Wilkinson. So the, the example is, is older than this, but the, the way to see it appears in, the, in a paper by Bonatti and Wilkinson. So let me explain this because it shows uh, how you can construct non-trivial uh, skew products. So the idea is you start with this manifold, it's T2 times the circle, and this is a, a trivial product manifold, okay? But now you want to construct a, a circle bundle over the torus, which is not a trivial one. So how do you do this? You cut. So it's, a, it's related to the surgery thing we talked in the morning. So cut uh, T3 along a circle. So we have this T3 over here. OK, so this is T2. And here we have S1. And we cut here, along, we make like a tube here, and we remove this tube we have here. And we glue it again by, f by pushing fibers in the, in when you do a circle, OK? So what, what we are doing is remove uh, the, uh, a solid torus. And glue again preserving the fibers. Okay, so you have now T two minus a disk times the circle, and you removed D times the circle, OK? Uh, minus, sorry. You have these two manifolds now. The, the boundary of each of these manifolds is a torus. OK, so this, this one, the boundary is equal to a torus. 
And this one, the boundary, is a torus. Okay? And each one of these torus uh, in the, this boundary is a, is a circle. So you have a foliation of this circle. So let me, this represents the boundary of D. And this represents the circle. So I, I cut this torus away, and then I glue back. But now, instead of uh, using the identity to glue back, what I do is I start rotating in each of the fibers. Okay, so this fiber, I glue it correctly, but then this one, I glue it a little bit pushed away. And when I make one turn, I did one turn of the rotations. Okay, so if, if, you, if you like a formula, you, you, you glue. Like, if x, x is, uh, let me use another word, s parametrizes this, and t parametrizes the circle, so you glue with s t moves to s t plus s, or n times s. Okay? When you glue this, you can show, so exercise, The new manifold is not T3. Okay? In fact, it's what's called a, a nil manifold. Okay? And now what we are going to do is to construct a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism here, which is Okay, but this is still a circle bundle over the torus. Okay, so you, you have a projection. The same, the, you have not changed the basis, so you can project to the basis and you get a torus. And so now you you wish to construct a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism, which projects to the anos of uh, to an anos of diffeomorphism. So let me explain how to do that. Okay, if you, if you don't believe in this construction, so let me say what, what do we have. We have N, which is a manifold, which is a, a circle bundle over the torus, meaning that the preimage of each point here is a circle, and this manifold is not a torus. And what we want is to define a function f from N to N, which is partially hyperbolic, and such that if you project, okay, so if you do F composed with P equals 2, 1, 1, 1 composed with P. Okay? So we, we want to make this example, and so to, to have it uh, partially hyperbolic, a uh, nice way to do this is to, to preserve the circle, the, fi the circle fibers. So P goes from the, ma the manifold to the torus, and, and I'm assuming this uh, is acting on, on the torus, okay? So uh, essentially what, what this means is that this F will preserve the, fi the, the fibers and it will mo move them as, uh, as an anosov, okay? And the, the easy way to guarantee that this will be partially hyperbolic is to know that the action on, on the fibers is an isometry. Okay, if we, if we manage to do that, it's easy to see that it's partially hyperbolic. It's, essentially the same uh, idea than that this uh, construction. Okay, these, these are also called skew products. So, So let me explain the trick. So choose 
u and b in T2. such that you have the following design. So this, this will be U, for example. And B will be something like this, the, the outside part. OK? <coughs> so from the way we constructed the example, we can choose uh, trivializations of this neighborhood. This is a circle bundle, so this you can trivialize. So that, so let's choose trivialization phi 1 from uh, don't know how what u times s1 into n and phi 2 from b times s1 into n. So this is, these are diffeomorphism preserving the fibers or something like this. So that if you look at phi 1 composed phi 1 minus 1 composed with phi 2, which goes from u intersected with b times the circle to itself, okay, and fixes the fibers, then these are all rotations. Okay? It's exactly the way we constructed the, the manifold. So you, you are cutting, making a turn. Here you are just making translations. And then you are gluing back like that. So you can choose these trivializations. OK, if you, if you don't believe me, that, that is the argument. Otherwise, you can believe that this is possible. And, and now, what we are going to do is to define one diffeomorphism which is supported here, one which is supported here, so that the composition will be nice. So exercise show that 2, 1, 1, 1 can be written as C1 composed with C2 such that, let me see, that, that what? C1 is the identity where? So C1 restricted to V is the identity, and C2 restricted to U is the identity. Okay. How, how do you do this? So that's why I, I draw u very big and b very small. So you just choose a diffeomorphism which is equal to a nos of here and glues to the identity outside. And then you compose, you, you, you take the inverse and you compose with this. So you have the identity in, in each one. And so once you have this, you can define C1 from n to n, such that uh, C1 equals identity on B and equals, how do I write it, uh, phi 1 composed with C1 times identity composed with phi 1 to the minus 1. Sorry. And C2 equals the identity on U and equals phi 2 composed with C2 times the identity composed with phi 2 to the minus 1 on, on uh, B, on the rest. Okay? So doing this, 
you get that the diffeomorphism f obtained as she uh, one composed with she two. This one has exactly this property because in the basis it's the composition of she one and she two which had this property, and it acts as isometries on the fibers because. Here it acts as isometries on the fibers. Here it acts as isometries on the fibers. And the change of coordinates are isometries. OK? So it's an exercise to show that f is partially hyperbolic. Okay, so so this, this was just to, to give an example of a, a non-trivial skew product, okay? so that, that the topology might change when you do this construction. And so let me just quickly mention some other reasons why uh, studying skew products uh, may, be, may be interesting. So this, this will be just a list of, of places in mathematics where skew products appear. But maybe some of you are interested in this other thing. So in general, the, there are several people which are interested in what's called iterated function systems. Which essentially uh, require if you have a finite number f1, fk of uh, diffeomorphisms of n, then uh, you want to understand the dynamics of the semigroup generated by these functions. OK, and, and a nice way to study this, uh, these objects is to construct a skew product which is partially hyperbolic. Okay, so how, how do you do that? You take a horseshoe with k different legs, and you make a, a product which is equal to f1 in this leg, f2 in this leg, f3, etc. So when you make this skew product, what you obtain is that the dynamics on this set k, k times n is, uh, resembles a lot the dynamics of this uh, iterated function system. OK, and so uh, this, you can always choose, and, and this is a, a very interesting remark here, that independently on the strengths of these functions, you can always create a horseshoe for which the contraction and the expansion are stronger. So you can always embed this into a partially hyperbolic system. Okay, so, okay, this is partially hyperbolic. And essentially this idea appears in many, many other contexts in mathematics. For example, when people look at random dynamics, which is like choosing at random uh, a diffeomorphism and applying it to a manifold, Usually, the, the notion of randomness is very related to the notion of a shift in a, in a, in a certain space, which is a horseshoe. And you can always recreate this, uh, this type of study by making a skew product over a horseshoe. Okay? The, the, same, the same goes for cocycles of diffeomorphisms. And uh, this is how a, a very typical hypothesis appears, which is sometimes called fiber Bunching. This, this hypothesis that appears very lo uh, a lot in, in the study of cocycles has to do with the fact that a skew product will be partially hyperbolic. Okay. Okay. So now in the in the in the rest of this lecture, I would like to to focus on. On one thing that will be very important for us, which are attractors. Okay, so let 
me speak about this. Attractors. Okay, so when when we discuss these uh, filtrations, okay, so if, if we have a partially hyperbolic diffeo, we have these filtrations, which are mapped inside themselves. And this separates uh, the, what we call the chain recurrence classes. Okay? But sometimes, understanding all chain recurrence classes might be uh, a very uh, hard thing to do. And sometimes we focus on a, a particular class of chain recurrence classes, which are interesting because they are attractors. So at least a lot of points, we know that a lot of points go to those classes. And so let me uh, just introduce a notion that will reappear mainly on, on Friday's lecture, which is the, the notion of quasi-attractor, okay? Definition F, uh, so Q is a quasi-attractor if two things. On the one hand, it, it is a chain recurrence class And on the other hand, it admits a decreasing uh, basis of trapping regions. This means that you can write Q as an intersection of UN such that f of un is contained in un, OK? So uh, a particular class of quasi-attractors, so a is an attractor, if uh, if not only this, but the, the same open set, you can obtain the, the set A. Okay, so it's, if, there if it is a quasi-attractor and uh, A equals the intersection of Fn of U. So you, you, you can find the particular uh, trapping region is an open, an, uh, sh just one open set. Okay, but why, uh, why do, do we focus more on quasi-attractors than, uh, than attractors? There are mainly two reasons today. One is because it's easier to guarantee that something is a quasi-attractor than an attractor. Okay? In general, we don't know when, when we take an open set, it, we send it inside, if it will stop somewhere and have new points, or it will continue forever towards our attractor. And this is related to the fact that these ones exist, and these ones not always exist. And this, th these uh, sets always exist, and they have very similar properties to attractors in a certain sense, so we prefer to study these ones. No, a, 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 the example would be something like this. So take uh, the dynamics on the line and take a sequence of periodic points converging to this point and make something attracting, repelling, attracting, repelling, attracting, repelling. So this point here, and the, on this side you put attracting. And so this point here has a basis of trapping neighborhoods that defines it. But it's not an attractor, because whenever you take an open set and you iterate it forward, it, it uh, stops somewhere. Okay, this, this is, of course, very non-stable. But in, in, 
in dynamics in higher dimension, this phenomena can be quite persistent. And so it's, it's important to treat these uh, kind of examples. So just to mention some examples. Let me explain a uh, generalized solenoid, which is uh, an example due to Bonatti, uh, Ming Li, and the way Yang. Okay, so. Maybe you already know the solenoid. In any case, I, I, I can repeat it. It's, you, you consider a solid torus, and you you make it see much so that it makes two turns around the circle. And so now, the, the usual construction of the solenoid makes this to be a, a hyperbolic set, okay? a hyperbolic attractor. I don't know if you, if you know this. You can construct this in order to preserve the foliation by disk here. And so you have a, an expansion in this direction, but and a, and a uniform contraction in this direction. However, you can imagine to, to do whatever you like here, as long as you preserve these uh, disks, and as long as you don't expand in this disk much, uh, more than this in this direction. So if you want, you can think about this example as a skew product over the Dublin map in the basis. Okay? So you can think about it as a, as a skew product. So each disk maps to another disk, and, but the, the mapping depends on the point, and you want that the expansions inside the disk are less than the expansions that two, than two, for example. So this map, you can write it in D2, D times S1 as a mapping of the form X T maps to uh, F T of X to T. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing the circle as zero, one quotient. And so what we require is that the derivative is smaller than two. And if we have this, we will have here an invariant cone field that will give a partially hyperbolic splitting for the, the maximal invariant set here. Okay? so. What I would like to explain is, is an argument due to Bonatti, Li, and Yang, which shows that if we do this correctly, we can ensure that there's, there's at most one quasi-attractor here. Okay? If we do it freely, we can make things here to be quite wild, and that many classes appear here. It's, in fact, they, they, what they do is they construct examples which have infinitely many chain recurrence classes inside here, but uh, the point is to show that there's at most one quasi-attractor. Okay, so let me explain that. For the moment, no restriction. Now I will put one hypothesis that will guarantee the existence of a unique Quasi attractor. Ah, 
the derivative of f of t is less than 2, and, and another condition is that f t of the disk is mapped inside the disk. Okay, so, so that we have this drawing, okay? We require this to be an embedding, okay? So we, we, the, the, we are not working in a global manifold. We're just defining an attracting region, okay? So the map is a map big F from here to here, which has this form, okay? And what we require is that the, the disk is mapped inside the disk, but uh, it changes one disk to the other with the rule of the Dublin map here. And then we ask for this so that the, the maximal invariant set here will be partially hyperbolic. Okay? So not, no other hypothesis. In fact, that's, that's the, the reason they, they do this, they, to, play, to be able to play with this. And then uh, uh, Bonatti and Shinohara have continued to play with these examples to get more interesting properties. But uh, the, the only property I will show is that under some assumption, you have only one quasi-attractor just to explain uh, a mechanism. So proposition. Assume that f of zero, okay, so the, the, the map f of zero, zero is a fixed point of this map, and we will ask that the map f of zero is a contraction, is an, uh, a real contraction. It has a, a unique fixed point, and everything goes there. Uh, is a uniform contraction. Then F has a unique quasi attractor. So let me do the proof of this. So the, the reason we are asking this hypothesis is to know that F, okay, so F has a unique fixed point P in D times zero. Okay, the, the unique fixed point is given because F, uh, uh, this, this disk is invariant and it's a contraction, so you have a unique fixed point. And the, the idea is to show any quasi-attractor contained in D times S1 will contain this point P. Okay, and since chain recurrence classes are disjoint or equal, this uh, completes the proof. Okay, so we will show that if Q is a quasi-attractor, then P belongs to Q. This is uh, enough for our, our purposes. So to do the proof, I will explain. It's, a, it's a very easy, but I will explain a little bit. So, because this this type of argument will be very important, uh, mainly on on Friday's lecture. So, 
y. So choose any trapping u which contains q. Okay? And now, okay, if, if we want to, to show that q, uh, p belongs to q, it's enough to show that p belongs to u for any trap in u containing q because we have this property. q is the intersection of every trap in set. So it's enough to show that p to show that p belongs to u. So how, how are we going to do this? So let me make a drawing here. So this here is d times 0. And we are choosing an open set u, which is a trapping region. So in principle, it does not intersect here. But, well, I, I won't draw u because we don't know where it is. But let me take any open set inside u, which uh, it's inside this set, okay? So take this ball b. And so what we know, since u is a trapping region, is that every iterate of b will be contained in u, okay? Because it's a trapping region. But now, if you look at what's uh, the dynamics here, you get that the projection, let me write it like this, the projection pi 2 of b in the second coordinate contains an interval. OK? So if the the projection contains an interval. As we start iterating, we are iterating the Dublin map. So eventually, we will intersect this region here, probably over here. This will be Fn of b. Okay, but as we intersect it here, if this point here, as we iterate it, it will converge to the point p. Okay, so we, what we have proved is that P belongs to the closure of the future iterates of U. And the future iterates, we can start by the third iterate if we want, so n larger than 1, and so this is contained in U as we want it. Okay, so this proves this uh, proposition, and I think I... Uh, just, just to finish, I, I don't have time to, to explain the rest of what I planned. The, the, the other thing I, I wanted to do is to show other types of attractors which can be constructed more or less in the same way as we did Manier's example today. They are called derived from a lot of examples. But then it's possible to play with which uh, eigenvalues you, you change in order to have different types of interest in attractors. So since I have no time, I, I, the, in the notes, there's some explanation on how to do uh, these examples. Okay, so I finish here. Thank you.